Amen. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it to Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible and you have your phone, you can get the Bible on your phone. Uh, you, you version is a great uh, electronic version. I like to have the hard copy that I can mark in and circle things and all of that. And it uh, doesn't matter which one you use. Just find one that works for you and use it. The best translation of the Bible is the one you'll read. I'm serious. I'm, I'm totally serious. If you don't read it, it doesn't do you any good to argue about how great it is. We're going to look at, at Colossians chapter 3, verses 11 to 17. Let me give you the big idea for the message. By the way, the uh, bulletin has an outline in the center. If you want to jot a few notes, you can do that. In fact, there's some blanks to fill in. I went back to that. I thought, well, we'll we'll help encourage people to write a few things down. So I got the blanks there, and probably some of our regulars already got them all filled in. You already figured it out, so that's fine. It'll be interesting to see whether you got it right or not. <laughs> there is no test afterwards, all right, no quiz. All right, big idea. If we want to honor Christ at Christmas, we must be intentional about it. Let's say that together out loud, please. If we want to honor Christ at Christmas, we must be intentional about it. One more time. If we want to honor Christ at Christmas, we must be intentional about it. Now, let me just say what I'm not talking about, all right? And I only got my phone out to, not only to turn it off, but so that if you have a, an honest spiritual question about the message, you can text me the question, and I'll answer that text while I'm preaching if I know the answer. I won't identify you. I'll try to let people know why I've all of a sudden stopped the train of thought to uh, answer a question. I, I refuse to respond to smart aleck remarks though, okay? If I get one of those, I might call you out. I might be tempted to call you out. I didn't say I would. I said I'd be tempted to, so you know, I keep you on the edge of their seats. I do appreciate the people who do the Facebook check-in for us. That, that spreads, uh, that's a free advertisement, uh, public relations for capital. And uh, if you have Facebook on your phone, of course, you can do that. You know how to do it. We're not going to talk today about simply reminding everybody that Jesus is the reason for the season. I, I believe that. That's very important. Okay? That's not what this message is about. This message is not about making sure you say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays, okay? I say Merry Christmas to people, but that's not what the message is about, all right? Those things are on the surface, you know, ways that we try to let people know that Christ is the reason for Christmas, but that's not what this message is about. This message is about making very certain that we show Christ in our lives, Because you see, if we are God's children through faith in Christ, and I, I don't ever assume that everybody is, so I understand that. But, but for those who have chosen to uh, be call themselves Bible-believing Christians, those who know Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, it's not automatic. People don't automatically see Christ in us. Sometimes they see us. And that's not always a pretty picture, is it? It was, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, you know, uh, the, the, as I read the Bible and read the story of Christ, the life of Christ, I am I'm impressed and in awe. And I would undoubtedly become a Christian if it weren't for all the Christians that I know. I don't know if he said all, but Christians that he knew, see. And what Gandhi was saying was that I see a lot of people who say, they're Christians, and I don't see Christ. So that's that's the reason, that's the kind of the premise on which this message is. That's why we're not in, in Matthew or Mark or Luke or John in a, in a story about uh, the birth of Christ. We'll have some of those. And next week, we're going to talk about the Prince of Peace. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What does that mean? That'll be next week. But today... 
I think that we need to understand that if we're going to keep Christ in Christmas, the, re- the way we do it is we show Christ in our lives. And by the way, that's 365 days a year, not just at Christmas. But it certainly is at Christmas if it's going to be the rest of the time, right? So how do we do this? How do we show Christ in our lives? Well, in, in Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul writes to believers at a city called Colossae, and he says, since you're risen with Christ, verse 1, you need to seek the things that are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God and put your affection, put your desires on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. In other words, Make sure that you are honoring the right things and going after the right things, things that will last for eternity. And if we are, and if Jesus Christ truly is our life, because verse 4 says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, Christ is your life. If that's true, then we need to manifest it, number one, by treating everybody the same. Treat everyone the same, verse 11. Verse 11. He says, we are, we put on, in verse 10, the new man. The opposite of that is in verse 8. Put off the old man. Put off the things that, of their past life, okay? The anger, the wrath, the malice, the blasphemy, the the dirty speech, the lying. He says, you don't do those things because you put that off, that old man with his old deeds, and you've put on the new man that's made new in the knowledge of the one that was your creator. Now, he says, in this person, Jesus, there is neither... Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. Christ is all and in all. What's that mean? What it means is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And God made of one blood all races of people to to live on the face of the earth. That's what it means. So you treat everybody the same. In fact, in Ephesians, when Paul wrote to those people at Ephesus chapter 2, In verses 11 through 16, he said, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. And those days you were living apart from Christ. You lived in this world without God and without hope. By the way, that's where many people are today. Ephesians 2.12 talks about people who are without God and without hope. Much of the culture that doesn't know God is without hope. I don't have any hope. And people need hope. People need hope. Paul says, but you used to be that way without hope, but now you've been united with Jesus Christ. And Christ himself, verse 14 of Ephesians 2, has brought peace to us because he united the Jews and the Gentiles into one people. He made peace. And in the Bible, God primarily talks about two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews, people, and then everybody else, he lumped into the phrase Gentiles. He created one new people from the two groups. Verse 16, together as one body. That's the body of Christ. Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. Now watch this. Ephesians 2.16 says, our hostility toward each other was put to death. So here's the convicting question I ask myself. Has my hostility toward any, any other peoples of any races or types or whatever, okay? Choose your class or your genre. I don't, I'm not going to take the time to go down all list them all because there's too many. But has my hostility toward any of those people inwardly, maybe not outwardly, but inwardly, has it ceased because of Jesus Christ? Because Paul said here in Ephesians 2.16, it's done, it's ceased, okay, it's finished. Galatians 3.28, in Christ, in Christ, there's no difference between Jew and Greek, slave and free person, male and female, you're all 
the same in Christ. Now, he wasn't saying there was no gender there. What he was saying was that, again, the ground is leveled at the foot of the cross. In Jesus Christ, God sees us all equal. And he wants us to see others like Jesus. Treat everybody the same. Paul said in Philippians 2, do not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but think soberly and humbly. And that's the problem. You know why people put other people down? I can tell you why. I know exactly why. People put other people down because in so doing in their minds, it makes them feel like they're superior, makes them feel bigger. But if you have to put somebody else down, so you feel bigger than you just showing how small you are, all right? And I'm not, I'm not trying to offend anybody or hurt your feelings. That's just reality, see? You don't need to put somebody else down because if you're God's child, you have, you're accepted by God. You can't get any better than that. Ephesians 1 says that we are accepted in him. He's accepted us. So. Uh, you can't get any higher than that, any higher praise than be accepted by God. And that's not because of you and me, it's because of Jesus. See? Because we've trusted him as our Lord and Savior. So we treat everyone the same. That's hard. I got it. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, number two in your outline, we need to put on the character of Christ. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as God's elect, holy and beloved, Tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Put on the character of Christ. See, God did not save you and me just so we could go to heaven when we die. That's the end of the trip. And everybody got, has to make a last trip, so you might as well, you ought to get prepared for that. But now, while you're here on this earth, then what's left? Well, He, he tells us what's left. Romans 8.29, Romans 8.29 comes right after 8.28, which everybody likes to quote for other people, you know. All things work together for good. We quote that for other people. We don't like to quote it so much for ourselves. But verse 29 is an interesting verse. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And a lot of people like to go down the, the road of predestination and talk about all what that means. In the verse right there, just limit yourself to what he says. He predestined you and me, watch this, to be conformed to the image of his son. So that says that God saved me and he said that he chose me to be like Jesus. Wow. God predestined me to be like Jesus Christ. Who do you want to be like when you grow up? Jesus. Jesus. You say, well, how do I know what Jesus is like? Right here. This tells you all about it. And the more you read this, the more you'll know what Christ is like. And the more you can be like Christ. I'll show you that because it's, it's further down in this passage. It's awesome. Put on the character of Christ. Romans 12, 3 says, because God has given me a special gift, I have something to say to everyone among you. Do not think you're better than you are. You must decide what you really are by the amount of faith God has given you. Ephesians 1, 4, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you, you should know that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit who is in you. You receive the Holy Spirit from God. So don't, you don't belong to yourself. You're bought with a price. So glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Philippians 2, 1 and 2. Since there's encouragement from belonging to Christ and comfort from his love and fellowship together in the spirit, are your hearts, Paul says to the people at Philippi, tender and compassionate? Paul says, then make me truly happy, folks at Philippi, by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. You see, when we put on the character of Christ, 
what that means is then that we will we will have the same feelings and thoughts and actions as Jesus. So you can say, what would Jesus do? I can say back to you, I can tell you what Jesus did because it's here. So what am I doing? What are, how did Jesus think? How did he speak? And then God says, now I want you to speak like him. You say, well, that, that's pretty hard. That's really impossible. I understand that. That's why God says that he gave us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is called in the Bible the Spirit of Christ. He indwells you if you're a child of God. You say, when did I get the Holy Spirit? When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. He came and indwelt you. And now he wants to make you, he wants to mold you into the character of Jesus Christ. That's a process. You say, well, I'm not there. No, neither am I. Join the club. Philippians 1 6, though, is a great verse that I take great comfort in. Paul says that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 6. What that means is that God's not done with any of us, He's working on us. And the more we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the more he is able to make us like Christ. And the more we're able to respond to people with Christ-like attitudes. Put on the character of Christ. Number three, forgive like Christ forgave you, verse 13. And if you notice, we're taking one of these from each of these verses. Okay, So we're just going through verses 11 to 17, verse by verse. Verse 13, forbearing one another. You know what that we you know what forbearing means? It means putting up with one another. And some husbands and wives say, I sure put up with a lot from him or her. Well, that's not exactly, you know, that's not the 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 intent, you know. It doesn't mean putting up with it and being, you know, having an attitude. Forbearing one another. And, watch this, forgiving one another. If anyone has a quarrel against you, and how, what, what's our model? Again, look at verse 13. Even as Christ forgave you, so also you should do. Now, a lot of people say, well, Pastor, well, you don't understand. This person hurt me so bad, they don't deserve to be forgiven. I understand that. I understand that I do not know what, they put you through. I got that, okay? I'm not denying that in any way, but here's what we have to remember. When we think about how somebody hurt us, the Bible says, you're to, I'm to forgive like Christ forgave me. So here's the big question that I have to ask myself. Did I deserve God's forgiveness when Jesus forgave me? No, I didn't deserve it. The Bible says, for by grace you're saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And not of yourself, it's a gift from God, not by works. So you can't work your way to heaven. You can't do anything to deserve God's forgiveness. You have to repent of your sins, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and by faith accept it, okay? You accept God's forgiveness. And he says, okay, now just like I forgave you, like Jesus forgave you, I want you to forgive others in the same way. Hebrews 12, 14, and 15, work at living in peace with everyone. And that's interesting the way it says it, work at it. So you have to work at this. Work at living at peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are holy will not, those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other. Now watch this. Look after each other. Hebrews 12, 15. So none of you fails to receive the grace of God. God's grace, by the way, is the spiritual energy that you and I need to live the Christian life. That's what grace is from God. The spiritual energy that you need to live the Christian life. Look out after each other so none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, and by it many are corrupted, corrupting many. So when, you, when we allow a bitter root to 
grow inside of us, it not only hurts us, it hurts others. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, do not be bitter or angry or mad. Never shout angrily or say things to hurt others. Never do anything evil. Be kind and loving to each other and forgive each other just as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Wow. You say, well, I, that's, that's not, that's impossible. No, it's not. It's not. I got it that everybody's different, okay? Having said that, listen to this illustration of the fact that it's not possible, all right? This was not too long ago in the news. Some of you undoubtedly saw this story on television news. Something happened in Texas that made waves around the nation. It occurred during the trial of a former police officer who claimed that she entered the wrong apartment after returning home from work. According to her testimony, she opened the door, saw the apartment's rightful resident, believed he was an intruder, and shot and killed him. She went to the wrong apartment. Okay, you got it? She thought she was going into her apartment, saw a man inside, and killed him. Pulled out a revolver and killed him. She was coming off duty. How many of you saw anything about that story? It happened about a month ago. All right, listen to the rest. Some of you know the rest of the story, too. She believed he was an intruder, shot and killed him. After hearing her case, the jury found her guilty of murder. Then something amazing happened in that courtroom. The victim's 18-year-old brother took the stand to give an impact statement. On earth, this young man will never see his older brother again. Never hear his voice or receive his advice or laugh with him. Their family will never again celebrate Christmas together. Yet, face to face with the woman who took his brother's life, this young man said these remarkable words. I don't want to say twice or for the 100th time how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. If you truly are sorry, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I love you just like anyone else, and I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you, and the best would be give your life to Christ, end quote. When he finished, he asked the judge if he could hug his brother's murderer. This is in a courtroom, so he protocol asked permission. The judge said yes. And the former officer ran into the young man's embrace with tears streaming down her face. Wow. Now, my friends, this kind of astounding expression of grace can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it says to me, it proves to me, it illustrates to me that it's possible. Forgive like Christ forgave you. Number four, love like Jesus did. If we're going to keep Christ in Christmas. We've got to love like Jesus did. Don't get ticked off at the person who takes your parking space. And the busy Christmas shopping. Get all stressed. All right, now you want to know about the love of Jesus? Here it is. 1 Corinthians 13. There it is right there. That's it. You say, what's that? That's the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. That chapter is all about love, and guess what it does? It never says what love is. It says what love does. That's, that's very insightful. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And the last verse in the chapter, I'll quote it to you. I could quote the entire chapter, but we don't have time. But the last verse says this. Here's what the last verse says. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. 
John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus Christ said, Now I'm giving you a new commandment to his followers. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my dis disciples, end quote. Love one another as I loved you. Now, how is love manifest? Well, love is spoken as in I love you. And everyone you love needs to hear that. Let me say that again. Love is manifested by being spoken, okay? I love you. I try to tell my wife numbers of times in the day, I love her. She does the same back to me. Do we do that because we have to? No, we just do it because that's a good habit, okay? We not only say it to one another, we say it to other family members, all right? Before we hang up on the phone. Why? Because people need to hear that we love them, all right? Everybody, everybody needs to hear it. And, and, People not only need to hear it, and by the way, so here's the convicting this question. When is the last time your father, mother, husband, wife, son, daughter, aunt, uncle, whoever, heard you say to them, I love you? Now, maybe you say, well, Pastor, well, you don't know. I haven't heard it from my, I haven't heard it from my family. They disown me. I, 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 I understand that, okay? That, and, and families are dysfunctional, by the way, okay? That's, that's the new normal. I got it, okay? But your loved ones need to hear it from you, whether you hear it back from them or not, all right? You say, I can't. Well, I know it's hard, but with God's grace, you can. But with God's grace. Now, love is not only spoken as in I love you. It's shown by actions. It's shown by actions, as in Jesus laying down his life. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Jesus sacrificed for his disciples. People are giving a lot of gifts this time of the year because of the Christmas season. Let me share with, tell you one gift you can give people that they will, I can promise you, appreciate, okay? At Christmas this year, one of the best gifts you can give people is the gift of, it's a four-letter word, your time. Your time. Because you see, that's something that we only have 168 hours of. Everybody has the same amount. And it's precious. And once you get, once it's gone, it can't be gotten back. Right? But if you, if you make time, to listen to people, to talk to people, to say encouraging things to people, to listen to people's stories, okay? To give whoever they are to you some time. That's greatly, greatly valued and appreciated. I'll never forget years ago when my two sons were small, I saw this cartoon that was a convicting cartoon from a little boy. It was a little boy with a baseball bat on his shoulder. It's a cartoon, you know, one, one thing. Little boy with a baseball bat on his shoulder and a glove over the bat, and he's standing there looking up at his too busy father, and he says, Play me or trade me. I thought, yeah, that's right. That's what they want. They want our time, don't they? Yeah. And see, it's not just little children that want our time. Anybody, everybody. Where I live now, on, in Whis I live in a nice townhome community called Whisperwood. There's tons of people in there who have no one, no one, and they live in a townhome by themselves. No one ever visits them. No one ever talks to them. 
You say, how do you know that? Because no cars ever drive up and ever drive away. They never come out of their houses. They come out to go to the mailbox. And so when I am doing, when I'm walking the dog or going to the mailbox and I see one of them, guess what? I make, I intentionally make time to go talk to that person. And you know what? Nobody's ever said to me, oh, get out of here. Go away from me. And I said that facetiously because that just illustrates that people are lonely. People want somebody to talk to. Now, I got it. Again, people say by way of their defense, well, I'm just busy. I'm a busy person. Yeah, I, right. I know that. Everybody's busy, folks. Everybody's busy. But we're not too busy to listen. Don't be too busy to listen, to give the gift of your time to people you love. Love like Jesus did. Number five, let God's peace rule in your heart and church and be thankful. Verse 15, let God's peace and above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. That's love like Jesus did. That was verse 14. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Wow. Let the peace of God. At Christmas time, many people are in pieces. <laughs> it's not peace, right? Yeah. They're stressed to the max. Trying to get all the gifts bought, trying to get everything done, trying to do this, they a long list, right? Not a lot of peace. Well, this says we can let God's peace rule in our hearts. And in your church, because that's where it says you're called in one body. And be thankful. So how? All right, here we go. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You should underline that verse in Isaiah 26, 3. Commit it to memory, okay? God says that he will keep us in perfect peace when our minds are, King James uses the word stayed, that means focused. That's why he started chapter 3. Set your, set your affection on things above. Focus. Fix your focus on God. God says, I'll keep you in perfect peace. Here's our problem. We look too, too much at our problems and not enough at our God. God says, no, no, what you need to do is look at me and I'll help you with your problems. See? But we give the bulk of our attention and time to focusing on the problems, on the issues, on the troubles. And where's God? Well, he's right where he always is. He's waiting to help us. He's waiting. Jesus said, come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And, verse 8, the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind. That word keep there means guard. God's peace can guard our minds. John 14, 27, Jesus said, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Why is he hesitating? Did he lose his place in the notes? No. I'm debating about whether it will do me any good to throw out this unsolicited piece of advice. If you're a fearful, afraid person, I can help you with that. Stop watching the news. Now, see, I did that, and I, I stuck my neck out now because I'm, now I'm subject to all kinds of criticism because I told people they're supposed to be ignorant of the news. I didn't say that. I said, if you're a fearful, afraid person, stop watching the news. All that does is work you up, get you more afraid, more fearful, more anxious. Someone said there are three things that rob you of peace of mind at Christmas. Guilt, grief, and grudges. That's pretty good. 
Guilt, grief, and gr grudges. Guilt. You don't have to walk out of here with guilt. God says, I sent a Savior to wipe away your sins so you can be forgiven. You can have a clear conscience. Jesus Christ came to forgive your sins. So trust him. Let him forgive your sin. He's the only perfect person who ever lived. You and I can't be perfect until God saves us. And then when he saves us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That takes care of guilt. What about grief? Well, if the truth were known, many people are in major pain at Christmas time. Christmas brings up all kinds of hurtful memories. People remember the loss of a loved one. They remember a parent who abandoned them, or a divorce they went through, or the death of a spouse or a child. You have grief, and that's understandable. That robs you of joy and peace of mind. Let me just help you with this. You were never meant to carry that all by yourself, that pain. That's why God says in 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your cares upon him. And if you can do that, you can receive the gift of peace. Cast your burdens on the Lord. Finally, grudges. That's being resentful. We feel guilty when we hurt others. We feel resentful or grudging when others hurt us. Well, sad news. You'll be hurt in life. That's a fact of life. Intentionally or unintentionally, how you respond to that hurt will determine your level of happiness in life. For your own sake, for your own peace of mind, you've got to let go of the hurt. Resentment doesn't hurt other people. It only hurts you. You're the one stewing and spewing while they're out there living their life. Some people are still letting folks from their past hurt you today. That's not wise. You have to let go of the grudges. Now, we already talked about this. People say, I can't. They hurt me too much. I can't forgive them. You're right. That's why you need Jesus. Only he can give you the power to do that. Why? Because they deserve it? No, they don't deserve it. But for your own sake, so you can get on with your life and not stay stuck in the past. By the way, I can help you with that. If there's somebody that's hurt you deeply and you're having a hard time forgiving him, pray for him every day. Pray for that person every day. Yeah. And pray this. Pray for God to bless them. Boy, that's hard. And then pray for God to help you to love them in spite of what they did to you. And you know what? After about 30 days of that, you're not going to be, you're, you're, that's going to melt away. That resentment, that bitterness that you've had in your heart, that's going to be gone. You say, how do you know? Because I've tried it. I've done it. That's how I know. Right. It's number six, keep the word of Christ dwelling richly in your hearts. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I could preach an hour on that, on that verse. There's so much there. Let me just unpack it like this, okay? The word dwell. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's the same word that's used for hus to husbands in 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor to them. Treat them with understanding as you live together. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Wow, that's a powerful verse, 1 Peter 3, 7. God says, husbands, dwell with your wife with understanding. That's the same word dwell that's used here in verse 6. So it's talking about a close, intimate relationship. That means God's word has a close, intimate relationship in my life, in my heart, in my mind. It's not just something I carry to church on Sunday and then throw on the shelf till I go the next time, see? It's something that I'm in every day, not to get sermons, but to get fed. Because, you see, God's word is our food. God's word is our bread. God's word is our meat. It's milk. It's what, it's sustenance and the more God's word dwells richly in your heart the more you'll be like Christ that's a promise finally number seven do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus with thanksgiving that's verse 17 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's talk about that name a little bit, okay? Acts 11, 26 and Acts 26, 28 and 1 Peter 4, 16 are the only three times in the Bible that you have the word Christian. Christian is only three times in the Bible. Christian in the Bible means Christ one. So a Christian is someone who belongs to Christ, not just somebody who uses his name. People use his name in vain, don't they? But when it says do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, that means do it like Jesus would. Do it as he would do. When we pray in Jesus' name, it doesn't just mean we tack on in Jesus' name at the end of our prayers. It means we're actually saying, Father, I'm asking you this because this is what I believe Jesus would want. Yeah, that's what it means in Jesus' name. This is what I believe Jesus would want. Now, here's the logical question that comes out of that. Well, how am I supposed to know what Jesus would want? Okay, back to that. Don't wait, no. Don't wait to know what Jesus would do. Do everything with thanksgiving. John 15, 20 and 21. Do you remember what I told you, Jesus said, a servant's not greater than his master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they'll persecute you. If they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. So here's my advice to you about people who don't believe in Jesus. Don't waste, your, don't waste your time in arguments with them, okay, as to why they should say Merry Christmas. If they don't want to say Merry Christmas, they don't have to, okay? Don't let that take away your joy. Do you understand what I'm saying? If somebody says Happy Holidays to me, I don't give them some flippant, smart remark. I just say Merry Christmas, smile, period. That's it. I don't need to preach a sermon, okay? In some stores, they won't even let their employees say Merry Christmas. The, the management says you're not allowed to do that, okay? So don't waste your emotional energy being mad at somebody because they didn't, you know, say Merry Christmas or they don't believe in Jesus like you did because guess what? The world crucified Jesus. They nailed him to a cross. And the day is going to come in America when people who are true Bible-believing Christians are going to suffer persecution. Now, I'm not asking you to be a martyr or saying that we're martyrs. I'm just saying don't expect the world to act like believers because a lot of believers don't act like believers. <laughs> All right? But just try to be like Jesus. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus with thanksgiving with a thankful heart and if you'll do that i promise you you'll keep christ in your christmas and people will see christ in your life and perhaps just perhaps someone will say how in the world can you be so peaceful in the middle of this stressful holiday and guess what? You just got an opening, an invitation to tell them about what Jesus Christ means to you. So make sure you know what you're going to say when somebody asks you that question. 1 Peter 3.15, be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And if you don't have Jesus Christ yet in your heart and life, invite him in today. He says, I stand at your heart's door and knock. If you open the door, I'll come in. I'll forgive your sins. I'll be your personal Savior. And I'll be a friend that never leaves you or forsakes you. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Well, their heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. If you were to die today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven? Do you have eternal life? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? A lot of ways to ask the question. But the most important thing is this. When you make your final trip, when death knocks on your door, will you have a place to stay? Jesus said, John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Do you have a place to stay? Do you have a place reserved in heaven? If not, I can help you make that reservation today. I invite you to pray this prayer silently from your heart to God. Just pray this prayer with me. 
and you got to mean it with all your heart but if you do god will hear you and god will give you what you need pray like this heavenly father thank you for sending jesus to die on the cross for my sins i acknowledge my sin and i repent of it i thank you that you know what i need I need Jesus in my life. I invite him to come into my life. Forgive my sin. Make me your child. Thank you for giving me your gift of eternal life. Help me now to live my life for you. And tell others what I've done here today. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer in a minute, God says he saved you whoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved and get eternal life romans 10 13. i'd like to thank god for giving you that gift if you'll let me if you pray with me a moment ago would you lift your hand right now and i'm not going to embarrass you i'm not going to ask you to come to the front i'm just going to pray for you thank you god bless you i see your hand man anyone else you pray that prayer with me a moment ago slip your hand up and put it down i'll see your hand and god will see your heart Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you want us to have your peace in our hearts and lives through Jesus. So I pray right now for this one that raised their hand. Give them the assurance of your presence in their life. And I pray for each one of us who know Jesus. Help us to keep Christ in Christmas by showing him in our lives as we saw today from Colossians 3. If there's somebody we need to forgive for Christ's sake like he forgave us, help us to do that. And help us to love people like you love us. Treat people the same. Not look down on people because they're a different nationality or a different religion. Help us to have love of your son Jesus working in our hearts and lives. And use us for your honor and glory, I pray. In Jesus' name.